Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It is the 20th of March, 2022. And as always, this is useful. Please like and subscribe and hit that bell icon to get notified of new videos. And this is the second time I'm recording this update because after completing it the first time, uh, worked out the microphone hadn't been working. So it was just complete silence. So yay, I get to do this one twice. Um, as always, the chapters are down the bottom of the video. We can go to the description to jump to particular updates. And a little bit of fun. It was my birthday a couple of weeks ago, and I just got a late birthday present from my wife. And it is a retro pixel version of me in the Streets of Rage style. So just a little bit of fun there. That is apparently sums up all of my videos. Hey, and uh, till next time, have a good one. So... I thought that was totally, totally cool. And I'll find some way to make this pop up in random technology videos whenever I can. New videos, I created a very long video all about virtual machines and the current state of the union in 2022. They're this real core building block to many things we do and use. So I'm gonna really walk through all of the capabilities as it stands right now. And then I did a video all about the new virtual machine scale set flexible orchestration mode, VMSS Flex. So if you're curious about what that is and how it differs from the current uniform version we have, uh, I go through it in that video. So on to the changes. So Trusted Launch is now available for ephemeral OS disks. Trusted Launch, remember, is part of the new generation two virtual machines in Azure that are UEFI based. That means they get a virtual TPM, they can use virtualization based security. And as part of that, they can do secure boot. That's that secure handoff from the UEFI through to the bootloader, the drivers, the kernel, the operating system. Ephemeral OS disk is where, hey, I'm not using a managed disk for the operating system. Instead, I'm using that cache area or the temporary storage on the host where my VM is. It saves me paying for managed disk. I get really low latency, high performance. And it's great when I have those kind of cattle scenarios where I don't really care about the state of that OS disk. It's just there to run. Maybe it's a virtual machine scale set, AKS for example. Well now, even when I do that, I can still use Trusted Launch and get that nice um, protection from rootkit, things like that. Azure Static Web Apps now has password protection. Remember, Azure Static Web Apps are great for hosting pre-rendered content. They can integrate very nicely with things like Azure Functions when I need some API to get called. They're geo-distributed. But in addition to the native authentication and IP rules I can do and use of private endpoints, I can now say, hey, I want to enter a password to actually use this. So if we jump over super quickly, if I go and look at an Azure Static Web App and I go to the configuration and general settings, we now see this option, hey, I can turn on password protection. And I can pick, is it just staging? Is it staging and production? And it's just an additional thing that I can now prompt for as part of getting access to that. App configuration now has soft delete. So app configuration is that service that's great for centralized management of application settings, feature flags. And with this option, I can configure a time from one to seven days to say, if I delete it, I can restore it back. I can also turn on purge protection so I cannot do a hard delete and then not be able to recover it before that time I set. So I can set this now at time of creation of the service. App Service JBoss EAP cluster support is now in preview. What this lets me do is there's different clustering modes I can do for JBoss EAP, but this is going to use the standalone mode, which is really how it's managed. And what I'm going to be able to do is I can now connect this to a virtual network. It will then boot into a clustered configuration. It will use the VNet it's connected to for that node to node communications, but it will now open up things like load bal balancing between instances sharing session state and more. So now I can use it as a platform for stateful applications, transaction coordination, where I need that high availability and makes it a, a much better platform for running my Java applications. Then Azure Container Monitoring is retiring 31st of March, 2025. Basically you need to go and get to Container Insights before then. 
And then API management now has private link support. I can have now private endpoints in virtual networks connecting to my API management. So if I'm a client of API management in a VNet, I can now go via the private endpoint. It's gonna work for developer, basic, standard, and premium SKUs. And I can have up to 100 private endpoints per API management instance. It is not supported with self-hosted gateway, which makes sense. Self-hosted gateway, remember, is a containerized version of this that you could deploy, for example, on-premises, i.e., those hybrid environments. On the database side, there's a lot. So MySQL Flexible, remember Flexible is the VM-based version of the managed database, gives me VM support, things like burstable, I can stop, start, I can have high available auto failover configurations and much, much more. So there are now new regions for the MySQL Flexible, China East 2 and China North 2. PostgreSQL Hyperscale, remember Hyperscale is built on the Citus extension that lets me shard the data with distributed tables. Now new minor version support is 11.15, 12.10, 13.6 and 14.2. And then PostgreSQL Flexible has minor version support 11.14, 12.9 and 13.5. So continually adding new minor versions to these. A whole number of new regions were announced as GA. So PostgreSQL Flexible is now in US Gov Virginia and Arizona, and MySQL Flexible is in US Gov Virginia. So this is really about taking those services and making them available in that sovereign government cloud. And then PostgreSQL Flexible HA has been added to new regions. So this is Central India, Korea Central, East Asia, and West US 3. This lets me, for example, have high availability to an instance in another availability zone. So I get resiliency from any data center level problems. And then there's a new set of PostgreSQL flexible extensions. So the first one is the time scale DB extension. That lets me have time series functionality on top of the native uh, Postgres database. There's also our FCE. This basically enhances Postgres with additional functions and operators that can help with compatibility as I migrate from a different database to Postgres. And then also there's a PG repack. If I think about getting rid of bloat from tables and indexes, um, this extension helps with that. On the SQL side, managed instance link is now in preview. I can think about now being able to replicate from regular SQL servers to Azure SQL Managed Instance. It's using the familiar always on technology. So as I do a commit to the primary SQL server, but it's also going to be committed to that Azure SQL Managed Instance secondary. That Managed Instance can act as a read only secondary replica. And if I think about what this is doing with that replication, this can also be a great solution for a really low downtime migration. I can have my SQL Server using the managed instance link to an Azure SQL MI and then migrate over to it. SQL maintenance windows are GA. So in addition to the default window we get out of hours, I now have the option to pick, hey, Monday to Thursday, 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. or Friday to Sunday, 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. So that lets us tune the window down that's a better fit for me. So both those 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. just depends, is it weekdays or the weekend days? That is the local time for the region to which you have deployed. This does not apply to dev test subscriptions. So if I'm a, like a Visual Studio dev test, I will not see this option. But for pay as you go, EA, um, customer agreement, CSP subscriptions, you will see that SQL maintenance window. And then leading on from that, I can now create alerts up to 24 hours in advance of those planned maintenance. It's using the regular service health feature of Azure. I can just go to service health and I can create alerts. Well, now I'll actually see SQL Server as, sorry, SQL Database service as one of the options in Azure Service Health. And from that, I can create alerts based on that and call an action group. So from an action group, I can send emails, send an SMS message, call a webhook, call an automation, whatever I wanna do, 
I can now hook into those through this, again, in preview. Server broker message support is now available for SQL Server to Azure SQL Managed Instance. If I think about Service Broker, this is the native SQL asynchronous message and queuing feature. So what I can now have is that Service Broker having messages going from Azure SQL Managed Instance and SQL Server deployments anywhere. Import export via private endpoint. When I do an import export of a backpack file, we use Azure Blob. And before on the firewall of the Azure SQL database, well, the, the server, I would have to say, hey, allow access to Azure services. What I can now do is leverage this service managed set of private endpoints. So I have a private endpoint to the Azure storage account, a private endpoint to SQL, and it will use that for the import or export, whichever one I'm doing. Uh, we'll have to go and approve those private endpoints when I go through the process, but now I won't have to open up that, hey, allow access to Azure services. I can just use the private endpoints. And then SQL Server on IaaS VMs now has a best practice assessment. I can go into my SQL Server VM resource. I can see SQL best practice assessments. I can enable it. It needs log analytics workspace. I can set a schedule and then it will present me with some best practices recommendations. Miscellaneous, Azure Monitor Agent now has private endpoint support. So Azure Monitor Agent, remember, is the replacement for the old log analytics agent, the diagnostics extension, the telegraph extension. If I want to use a private endpoint with Azure Monitor, we have an Azure Monitor private link scope, an AMPLS, which encompasses all of the different endpoints I need to talk to monitoring. Well, now Azure Monitor agents can talk to a private endpoint, which is basically its data collection endpoint that is using an Azure Monitor private link scope. So a lot of words to say, hey, the new agent can now use your AMPLS. Azure AD combined security registration has gone GA. I'll be honest, I thought this went GA ages ago. It's been out, I think, for about two years. And it's the idea that I can register for multi-factor authentication as a user, and I can register for self-service password reset as a user. And there's a lot of similarity between the pieces of information I give. So combined registration avoids a lot of that duplication. I can configure it today. So I've been able to configure this for a really long time. So if I just go over to my Azure AD instance and I go to my user settings and I go to my manage user features, sure enough, we see, hey, users can use the combined security information registration experience. I guess the idea, this is no longer saying preview and this will become the default for all tenants from the 1st of October, uh, 20. 22. So there you go. Windows 365 has nested virtualization coming. They've announced it. I think it's preview in April. Nested virtualization means that, hey, I can run a VM in the VM that is your Windows 365 environment. All VMs in Azure, they obviously are a virtual machine. So this lets me run a VM in a VM. So where this is useful, things like running Linux applications, running Android applications, I'll now be able to use in a Windows 365 environment. And then Azure AD meeting the memorandum 2209 has a documentation really walking through that. So this is all related to the executive order for improving cybersecurity. So if I'm using Azure AD, this walks through, well, some of the aspects of what it means and then particular steps to perform to meet those various requirements. And then my final update is just some retirements. So dedicated hosts skew retirements. Remember dedicated host is the ability that I basically buy the capacity of an entire box, then I can fill it with different size skews of the same type as the dedicated host. And what's happening is some of the older dedicated host skews, these type one and type twos are going away and it's, hey, we should move to a type three or a type four. So that's uh, 
the retirement. There were some other retirements announced around .NET and Node, so maybe just check those out if you're using those environments as well. But that's it for this week, uh, for the second time we're recording this. Hopefully there's not a third. Until the next video, take care.